Uh, welcome everybody to the December um, evening meeting. Uh, it's nice to see uh, a nice full packed uh, room again. Before we get on to the, uh, the main presentation, um, we uh, would like to uh, have a few minutes uh, discussing from uh, Christoph here the new specification for tunneling, fourth edition, that has gone live on the BTS's website today. So, a couple of slides and a few minutes from Christoph. All yours. Christoph has been the uh, main uh, person behind getting the uh, latest uh, edition uh, updated and through all, all the uh, printing and everything else, um, or, or into its PDF format. So, okay. Thank you, Rod, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so, those of you who have been in our November meeting might recall this slide which we put up here on the screen. And I'm really happy to confirm that, in fact, we made it. So um, I'm absolutely, uh, honestly, I'm chuffed to bits that we did it on time uh, and um, actually free to download for everyone in the industry worldwide. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is obviously uh, I played a role, yes, but this is a team achievement, uh, as we will see on the next slide. Um, this is a BTS project uh, where we consolidate our experience and our members, and uh, thereby um, are, put ourselves into the position to pull off something like that, which is actually quite amazing. Um, <clears throat> you've seen 22 authors, high quality authors, obviously. Uh, we, have, uh, we have three workshops uh, with industry engagement, 29 attendees, uh, our uh, very, very busy peer reviewers uh, made sure that uh, none of the editor editorial team uh, was particularly bored during the production. The 250 plus comments are actually, um, how many? 417 comments, each lovingly closed out individually. Um, here, the next two slides <coughs> uh, are just intended to demonstrate the, the wide range of uh, our contributors, which uh, come from all of the industry. We have consultants, we have owners, we have suppliers, manufacturers, we have contractors. This is actually the big strength of this document because it um, prevents uh, a, a bit of a, how to say, as a designer, sometimes I'm simply blinkered. I don't see the wood for the trees. How do you build the thing which I'm putting on paper? But here, um, with <coughs> this collaboration, this industry-wide collaboration, ensures that something like that does not exist. Uh, it's uh, a relatively holistic, um, well-rehearsed, uh, well-reviewed document, and I hope it will be really helpful for years to come. Um, this slide, <coughs> coming to, to um, um, some, some additional thoughts about um, what we are standing for, we, the British Tunneling Society, I think it's a, it, it arises from uh, the need of all the people who work uh, below ground uh, to work together, uh, to collaborate, because it's, it's, it's not risk-free, not at all. Uh, we've just seen had this, this uh, tunnel collapse in India, which uh, luckily uh, did not cost any lives. <clears throat> so we tunnelers, we, we tend to, to gel. Uh, we tend to like to work together, to collaborate, and this is what we've done. And um, <clears throat> this here is the outcome of um, the British Tunnel Society, which is our platform. This is us <coughs> working together to produce something for the whole of the industry. So <coughs> my um, ask to you is fundamentally, take this opportunity of um, the specification being issued, talk about the BTS, motivate people to join us, uh, motivate people to stand uh, for a committee at some time in the future, and in particular, <coughs> give us new members uh, which help us with the next specification, because I really don't want to do it all over again, myself. This is already the last slide. Um, <clears throat> it's open access, as we said, free to download. <clears throat> and the, uh, I tested the QR codes, they do work, and uh, they're not leading you to any dodgy websites whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> you can download it. At the moment, the download works uh, by individual chapters. Um, it's uh, maps maybe a bit confusing that it's not one document uh, click and it all lands on your uh, computer. 
Just be patient, it's six clicks and you're there. Super. And of course, uh, this being the time of Christmas, if you're looking for a gift for your loved one and your <laughs> <laughs> Emerald Publishing will certainly be very happy to supply you with an excellent paperback of the BTS uh, specification fourth edition. That's it, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for your help. Uh, all of you have contributed to that by uh, paying your membership fees or by being a bit more active. Thanks, everyone. I think this is our collective success. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah and thank you again, Christoph, for getting us to this uh, point. It's, uh, it's uh, great to see uh, another specification and an updated one on the BTS website. So, moving on to um, this evening's uh, presentation, evening lecture, um, I'm not going to do the normal format of introducing each of the presenters because we've got six here this evening and we'd be here quite a while, so I'm going to rely on each person to introduce themselves and give a short update on themselves as they get up to do their presentation, I think is the easiest way forward. So let's moving on first with Iva and the Silvertown project. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to um, our Christmas talk on Silvertown Tunnel. It's so good to see so many here and so many friends and people who worked on Silvertown Tunnel. And particularly to Pat and Marie. Marie, you can see what Pat's been doing now while he's been away from your home. So let's look at Silvertown in the context of the urban sprawl of London. It'll be the lowest downriver fixed crossing of the River Thames within London. It will be, it'll serve the east end of London, an area that is exploding in population growth and provides a third of London's working population. <coughs> Our tunnel is an 1,100 metre long twin bore tunnel driven from Silvertown in the north, on the north bank of the Thames to North Greenwich on the south bank, where the machine was turned around and driven back to Silvertown. A 12-metre diameter earth pressure balanced tunnel boring machine was used to construct the 10.66-metre internal diameter tunnel. In addition, we've mined seven cross passages using various methods of ground treatment with the four under the river in particular being mined in frozen ground. Historically, um, this part of London has been, has been a traditional hub of industry um, of the City of London. And you can see in the photograph the Thames Barrier, the Royal Docks, and our own leisure dome, the O2 Arena. Um, now, ironically, um, our, our tunnel will probably be the last factory constructed in this part of London as residential property is fast taking over. And probably one last mention, um, the Blackall Tunnel, um, which is in this photograph but under the river, um, the oldest um, under-river vehicular tunnel in the world, constructed in 1895 in the most appalling ground conditions, similar ground conditions that we had to deal with on Silvertown. So something of the contract, Transport for London, the project sponsor, the project owner. And they contracted with the special purpose vehicle um, for uh, the design, operation, maintenance of the Silvertown tunnel. Um, contract value roughly a billion pounds. The SPV contracted in turn um, with the Riverlinks construction joint venture um, for the design and construction of the tunnel. And with most of these arrangements, I, I work for um, the Riverlinks construction joint venture. We all work for the construction joint venture. With most of, as most commonly with these arrangements, most of the risk was passed down to the design and construct contractor. So for us, certainty and outcome was essential. 
certainty in time, certainty in programme. Time is very much money to us, and certainty in risk. So all of our solutions, although innovative, had to provide certain outcomes. So our Christmas lecture. Rather than listening to me talking about how I thought we constructed it, and probably getting it wrong, we've decided to bring along the young engineers who actually built it, who will tell you how it was built. And we'll start um, with Siva on uh, the TBM drive. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Siva Breshadlan. Um, I'm the one of the ship manager working on um, uh, revealing this project. Uh, first of all, um, I want to talk about our TBM. So our TBM UK's biggest ever uh, TBM to date, and uh, we called a Jill. I will uh, go through later why we called a Jill. So it was manufactured by Herring Connect in Germany and delivered to UK. And the type of the machine was earth pressure balance shield. And the <coughs> diameter is 11.91 meters, and the length is 82 meters. That in the main shield and the, and the three um, gunneries. So you can imagine the size is quite, quite big. Uh, the total weight is uh, 2,300 uh, tons. And we um, excavated nearly 600 tons of materials, uh, total distance of 2.24 kilometers. And we managed to complete the drive, both drives, and also turn around, and some delays took 236 days to complete. So it's quite good. So why we call it Jill? Jill was um, the first female to drive a bus, London bus, in June 1974. So we done the on-site um, competition uh, to choose a name. You know, our normal uh, common practice to give a name for the TBM's uh, female names. So we uh, done the competition, and the on-site staff uh, voted for um, for Jill as a name. I think it's a quite uh, good project to name after her uh, because this is the first tunnel to um, take double-decker buses under our river Thames. So none of other um, tunnels can't take it. So I think it's, uh, it's a quite uh, good uh, uh, tunnel to uh, honor her. Uh, next, I want to talk about how we managed to bring this uh, TBM from Germany to to our site. Um, so it was um, loaded into um, uh, Rhine River run barges from Kale. The Kale, uh, there's the factory, um, can can factory. So we loaded into barges, and barges reached to Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam, that's in Holland, and then we transferred in the ships, and the ships uh, uh, brought it to Royal Victoria Docks. So from Royal Victoria Docks, we brought them onto our site uh, by trucks. Um, so you can see um, some of the photos we took uh, when we offloaded from the barges. We choose the night, night time to do the deliveries because of the traffic condition. So to avoid that, uh, we choose um, night time. And we brought them as a components to site and we done the assembly on site. Uh, some of the photos you can see uh, when we um, done the deliveries. The next I wanted to talk about the, the launch chamber. is one of the unique design we done. Um, it's an innovative, we call peanut shaft design. Uh, the reason for that is uh, due to the land right constraint on site. Uh, we designed to develop a solution to working in compression that would avoid using of angles into the ground. So 
This design is basically four shafts interlink each other to form as a peanut shape. Um, this is also the first time we use a second piles uh, in UK to build this uh, shaft. You can see that uh, the total length of the shaft is 66 meters, and, uh, and the narrowest width you can see is 13 meters. Um, so you can imagine our TBM is 82 meters, and, uh, and the diameter is almost 12 meters. So it's very tight space we work with. Um, that's the early stage of uh, construction, um, the shaft. And you can see the, the final finish of the shaft, that's including the retrieval chamber on your right hand side. And also the full setup, you can see the ganries and also the lay down areas for the segments. Um, on the, at the last we call was shaft one, two, three, four. You can see the last fourth shaft is fully occupied by the, the, the conveyor system, the riser and the, and the hack system. So we end up with only three shafts to work with. So that's more smaller. So it's less than 50 meters to work with. So that's the reason we decided to uh, split the ganries into halves. So initially it was a three, uh, the shield itself and three ganries. Then we decided to split them in half in order to uh, launch them. So we launched them in two phases. So the first phase, um, you can see the other photos. Um, this, you, can, you can see the photo on the left hand side, um, how tight our TBM was. It's only half a meter either side to work with. Um, and also, we won a couple of awards for this um, sharp design, and we're proud to say that. Uh, so I want to go through how we um, lift it down. We used uh, 750 ton cranes, most of them and also the various cranes from 40 ton um, ganries to uh, different uh, ganries, uh, the, the crane edges, and the, the main one we use 750 to lift it down all the components. And the main shield is because too heavy and um, we had to um, end up with filling, uh, the building inside uh, in the pit bottom. Uh, all the components, most of the components like screw conveyors and uh, cutting, cutting heads, we lift it down uh, separately to build um, at the pit bottom. So the sequence, uh, as I said, we divide it into two phases. So the first phase, the first stage, we done the shield and the gantry one, and we split the gantry two in two. So two ways, so those three uh, sections we um, push them in first, so we launch that one first. Then we dropped, uh, lifted down other three sections, that's 2B, 3A, and 3B. Then we uh, launch the second phase, and you can see the, the full stretch of the TBM after that they all connected together, then we done the full at once, full phase. So, how we did manage to complete this challenging TBM drive? I think um, it was uh, the good site setup and the good logistic plan and of course the teamwork. Um, it's a huge challenging area. It's the location is very uh, congested and lots of traffic movements. So the logistic plan was very, very uh, key. And we set up um, our main storage area the left hand, uh, the far left hand corner, you can see. Uh, so that's the place we brought all the segments um, and we done all the checks, make sure they are all in, uh, in the right design and or any defects and we checked everything that. Then we moved to the segment uh, yard, I will show you later. Um, that's the muck tipping and barge um, loading areas where we brought all the uh, marks uh, through the conveyor system and tip down there and the lodges, um, the, all the barges will load it from there. And the waste treatment and storage areas and that's our site uh, main office and also the TBM control room we set up there. The reason we uh, set up that very close to the shop so we can get easy access and um, we can monitor easily. So that's a segment yard and also gantry crane loading area. So 
all the segments we brought to main storage area for our checks. And uh, after we approved, we brought everything to segment yard to lay down in an order sequence so we can easily lift it down to send to the TBM for ring building. This on the uh, right hand uh, corner on the, uh, on the top, you can see that's the area we um, assembled all the TBM components. Uh, before we lift it down in sections, we assemble down there. And that's the section you can see our launch and retrieval chamber. And finally, the SCL and uh, crowd uh, batching plant area. So those are the key uh, setup we, um, we done on site. And I want to talk about uh, segments. So segments are manufactured and delivered from Ireland. Uh, Banaha Precast Concrete Limiteds. They are the one uh, done the cast for us, the precast. And it's about 10,100 segments cast. Uh, we work with Banaha to develop a concrete mix um, containing 40% of GGBS, uh, which is recycled by product of steel, uh, giving an automatic carbon reduction of 40% per unit. So that's really good, uh, we work with them. And also they use the green energy. Uh, they use 40% uh, of solar panel uh, and also 60% of uh, renewable energy to cast these segments. Uh, so they done the pretty good works. So we have three types of segments we used. Uh, one is a steel fiber, that's the main one. And the steel cage reinforcement, uh, that's mostly we use as cross passage and also shallow areas. Uh, some of the segments are very special, uh, heavily uh, reinforced, where we use at the cross passages. My colleague, Christina, will go through more detail how they design that. Um, and each lorry um, can only take um, three loads. So that means uh, for complete drive, we uh, done about 3,600 trips from island to, uh, to our site. So how we brought them? From uh, Banaga Precast uh, Concrete Factory, we loaded them in lorries, crossed with the ferries to Holyhead, uh, North Wales, and from there, we brought to site. So that's the way we brought it. Um, to, to talk about some um, detail about our ring and uh, segment design, uh, we use um, left and right rings to navigate the, uh, the curves and slopes um, to get the, the radius, the maximum radius. And also we use, uh, use uh, nine segments in total, each rings. Uh, that's eight standard one and one um, the key ring. Uh, the internal diameter of the tunnel is 10.66 uh, meters. And the thickness of the segment is 400 mil, it's quite thick. And the length is uh, two meter. Uh, the joint uh, connectors, uh, we use guide rods and also dowels. Uh, the standard dowels and also we use called, um, uh, special flexible dowels. The reason for that is whereas the curves or high slopes, it started to crack if you use the normal uh, dowels. So we decided to go for flexible dowel, uh, dowels that will give the flexibility of uh, the, the, the connection. Um, and, and also the water tightness uh, EPDM gasket. Um, you can see on the, in the middle picture the gaskets already there. And also we use the called VMT segment scanning system. Uh, so the way it works, uh, as soon as the delivery come, uh, the engineers and the quality team will check, make sure they all um, right as for the design and any defects or any damage. So we log everything into the, the VMT system and then we move to segment uh, yard, and before we lift down into the, uh, into the pit bottom to send for the, uh, the ring building, we do the second check again to make sure they are sending the right segment. Because if we send the wrong segment, and uh, if we feed it already into the uh, segment feeder, it's a hunting size, it's very hard to take them back. So we need to make sure we send in the right segment uh, to, the, to the right uh, ring building process. Uh, so we normally do three checks. The final checks, the shift engineer will do the final check just before we load into the uh, segment feeder. He do the final checks and he click, it's okay to build. So that's those uh, three checks we done through the VMD segment scanning system. It's a really good system, 
is work good with us. So you can see after we uh, um, lift it down, uh, the pit bottom that's called MSV is a multi-service uh, vehicle. Um, we use that so when you load it in, onto the multi-service vehicle, we need to make sure we are putting in the right order. So when the when the uh, multi MSV is driving is is only way we can lift it out in the right order. So it's, uh, it's make sure that's really important, that one. So we uh, normally bring them, sent into the TBM, then it's lifted by um, the segment uh, cranes in the TBM, and then finally we build the rings. Um, the next I wanted to talk about um, our tunnel drive and geology, uh, the ground condition. So we started from uh, our launch uh, chamber, uh, Silvertown, um, and that's southbound is 1.1 kilometer, and turn around at Greenwich, and we relaunch again, and 1.1 kilometers, 1.14 uh, kilometers northbound tunnel, and then we um, came to retrieval chamber again to Silvertown. That's a total of 2.2 four kilometers. So geology um, is very complicated ground conditions, uh, mostly alluvium, uh, clay, sand, gravel, uh, harvest formation, and Lambeth group, uh, and lots of water pressure. So you can imagine it's, uh, it's a mixture of all layers being gone through. Um, and uh, the maximum cover from the surface to the top of the tunnel is 23 uh, meters. And the, and the minimum cover was 7.2 meters. That's under the riverbed. Uh, so you can see that uh, how close we went. Uh, so the major challenges um, is the interventions. Because of the ground conditions, we, we knew we were going to change uh, quite a few uh, of the tools. Uh, so we planned some of the interventions. And also, we. Um, set up all the equipment for the unplanned interventions. Yeah, that's a hyperbolic interventions. So the planned interventions, we, um, we, we, we made the ground and we know the ground so we can easily go and uh, do all our inspection and tool change. Unplanned, we don't know anything happen anytime. And there can be, a, you know, the ground condition can be a, very bad. So we need to ready for it. So we train the, our operatives as well to do that kind of interventions. Uh, the next one is the conveyor system. We had lots of uh, uh, blockage in the, in the hoppers and the belt slipping because of the ground condition. It's not consistent. And we um, end up with you know, lump of clay coming in suddenly, or sand, or suddenly water. So it's, it's quite a tricky ground condition we dealt with. And the next one, uh, we had some issue with the uh, damage of, of the brush, and uh, that caused delays to change them. Um, uh, during the primary grouting, we lost quite a lot of uh, grout loss, uh, so we ended up with changing them. And also water ingress. Uh, we used a geoform injection to seal, uh, to stop the water getting into the, uh, on the, uh, the face. Uh, while we are doing the interventions or when we change the brushes, we use the geoform injection to, uh, to stop the water get there. Um, so the interventions, I want to go through with the interventions. The first one uh, we done at uh, CP7, that's about uh, 40 meter into the uh, southbound advance. Um, the way we done it is uh, we um, installed 14 deep wells to dewater the area. And also, we installed some soft piles uh, to, um, to make sure the ground is safe for us to do the interventions. Um, so that's the first one done. So basically, we changed um, the cutting disc to ripper. The cutting disc mostly we use uh, for going through the concrete uh, faces or uh, the hard surface. And the rippers mostly is, is good with uh, clay and soft grounds. So we, uh, we changed that one at CP7. Uh, it was a planned one, so it went well. Um, and the second one also uh, is a planned intervention. Just before we break through again into the Greenwich shaft. Um, and that one, that, that ground also um, treated. Um, because that um, in the uh, Greenwich site, 
so more granular material, so very weak. So we decided to uh, do the surcharge of 25 kilopascal to uh, make sure it's uh, counterweighted uh, to take the, the TBM pressure. So we done that one as well. Then we, uh, that time, we changed the report to disk again, because disk is important to cutting through the uh, concrete surface. So we done that, and then we returned and relaunch again. And the third intervention, we done at uh, around CP cross passage one area. And uh, again, we changed the uh, disk cutter to reapers to go through the soft uh, ground conditions. Uh, while we are um, um, mining halfway through, we had lots of issues because we lost the, uh, the, the wear detector. So we couldn't see um, any uh, wear and tear on the tools and also lots of pressure, head pressure we felt. So we decided to do some interventions um, halfway through, but it's failed because of the high pressure, water pressure, we couldn't manage to do it. So we uh, kept moving and uh, we fo finally we found the location of CP5 uh, area. That's about halfway, just about halfway. And uh, we managed to get access, and also we done as a normal uh, free air intervention there as well. So luckily, we never use any hyperbaric interventions. Uh, and finally, again the CP7 same location, uh, we done the the final tool change. Um, that's um, again we change the ripper to this cutter. So as I said, you know we uh, we completely avoided to um, use the unplanned pressurized interventions. Uh, you can see some damages and worn out tools that we changed. You can see the difference between the disc cutter and the, and the rippers and why we changed them. You can see that uh, difference. Uh, so it's quite, quite a lot. So you can see the numbers there and the damages you can see that uh, is all because of the, the ground condition was really bad. Uh, so a total of 992 tools we changed. The next I wanted to show you about the, the brushes. You can see the damages to the wire brushes. That's the reason we had lots of grout leaks through it. So we, um, we end up with uh, changing them. I think we, uh, we found the reason why it was uh, damaged because the, when it's a high curves, we try to uh, monitor the, uh, the TBM. That time is one side is hit uh, on the ground uh, and again the shield and it's can, you know, pushed, pushed in or damaged. Um, and also, we, uh, when we are passing the cross passages, we force the TBM because we need to make sure that the, the right segments falling into cross passage openings. So we force the TBM as well to, to go in one way. Uh, so that's other reason as well is uh, it's got damage. And uh, we um, finally decide to change them. And uh, otherwise, it's quite a lot of grout leak. It's not good for us. So we change them. It's changing is not easy. It's hard as well. So we need to uh, advance and take out the plate and then cutting, welding. So it's, uh, it's really delay our program. And, uh, and also we need to control the water getting through as well. So we need to do the, all the form injections and everything before we uh, do the repair works. Um, some obstruction you can see um, is, uh, I think is from the old uh, assisting pile casing and piles. Um, they managed to escape through the cutter head and also um, came through the screw conveyor. And this, this one caused some problem to the conveyor belt as well, so blocking off. So we managed to took this one out as well, you can see. And finally, we, um, we completed the advances and broke through to the uh, ritual chamber into uh, Greenwich and we dismantled and uh, lifted out all the components. Mostly the, the, the shield section we uh, dismantled from uh, Silvertown and the gantries we pulled back uh, towards Greenwich to speed up the program to lift the, the, because the shield will take quite a long time to uh, dismantle it. And then the Herring Connect uh, brought it back, most of the components, and they brought, they take him back to Germany. Um, that's from me. Thank you very much. Thank you for me. Um.
there's space at the front here for those that stood at the back, if you could come down. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Shepherd. Uh, you may know me from various projects, High Speed 2, Bromford Tunnels, uh, Tideway West, Lee Tunnel, DLR, etc. I'm going to tell you a bit about the TBM rotation. So, as Siva has mentioned, 1,600 tonnes, the main shield, and three gantries, all about 20 metres in length. So, this is our rotation shaft, uh, which is a generous size. Um, TBM broke through on the 15th of February, which is when this photo was taken. You can see that the site's quite constrained um, with the road network feeding the O2 arena, so we can't close that off. Um, and the, the craneage is quite a challenge because the northbound drive is on the far side of the shaft. So even at a 30, 40 meter radius, you're only gonna lift around 30 tons there. So we had to look for a, a different solution um, to rotate this TBM within the shaft. So a couple of case studies we looked at um, with small footprints uh, was the rotation of the um, Fielder Tunnel TBM in Germany, and that was on a nitrogen air deck. And also a bit further in the past was the Sprabo Tunnel in Italy, and that was on a, an air deck, slightly, slightly different. We couldn't really use an SPMT um, because of the footprint. If you think about 40 tonnes per axle, they start getting quite big. So preparations for the turnaround. Um, we had a, a launch can, which you can see there, and a seal can bolted onto that. And if you look closely, it's actually cut into the D-wall slightly. Um, we're that tight on space. Uh, so real thick, heavy steel work in the base for the thrust frame and the launch rails and also some <coughs> jacking plinths. So that was quite a coordination with the permanent works rebar in the shaft. And as you'll see later, we also installed a 15 mil thick steel floor to which, for which the TBM would float around on. Did look at other options for this, um, but we, we played it safe. So the thrust frame and the pressure ring, both around 115 tonnes or so in component parts. They were recycled from the first drive used in the launch at Silvertown. So the, the process of rotation, we excavated out into the concrete. We then installed a thrust retention system. We pushed out um, building rings behind us. We moved the TBM across the shaft, uh, built segments on the cradle for the following gantries to come out. Uh, we then installed the pressure ring and thrust frame, pushed the machine to the face for the next drive. We rotated gantry one, installed the conveyors, and then we set off and mined 80 meters just with gantry one before rotating gantry two and three, and then setting off with the full backup. So rather than me explain all that, it's easier to show you what we did. So you can see the retention system going in there. There's three pairs of cylinders. Uh, there was a strut between the cutter head and the bulkhead to stop pressure on the main bearing. On the left hand side there you can see the main cradle for the shield. In the background the thrust frame is going together. You see all the steel floor is installed. Around the machine goes. <coughs> Very quick. And there's a few more jacks going in if you look closely, and the machine will advance. There's the pressure ring on the same system moving across the shaft. We couldn't lift it that far. Segments going in to pull the gantries out. Machine shoved forward to the face, and you can see the pressure ring launch. DV dag bars going in and the jacks. Now you'll see at the bottom the gantry frames going in and you'll notice it, it's in two halves, a bottom half and a top half. Around gantry one goes all the main components on gantry one to reduce the umbilicals. Conveyors go in and there's a 12 meter pressure launch. So no segments until that stage is finished. 
You see a forklift come in, start feeding segments. Mine are 80 meters. We then take the conveyors out and gantry two and three fly around in no time at all. In the go. And uh, so I'll, I'll break that down into a little bit more detail. Thrust reaction frame, uh, mainly to stop the shoulder, the rings falling in where you're building. So minimum build pressure of 40 bar. Uh, keeps everything nice and controlled as we're pushing out into the shaft. I uh, don't know if you noticed, but there's a special lifting cradle devised as well, um, just like a saddle. So the machine comes out at a 4% gradient and has to go into drive two at a minus 4% gradient. So over 10 metres, that's an 800 mil difference in level. So what we had to do, we had to lift the machine level, so we jacked it up um, before the nitrogen air deck could go underneath and then back down. So the centre of gravity was critical. Uh, we had to check where the cutter head was, where the erector was positioned. And we also built ring one of drive two at the end of drive one um, because we didn't have enough space to feed segments in for the second launch. That had to be calculated as well. Obviously, the, the advantages of this lifting belt are to reduce welding on site and time. Uh, there's a close-up picture of it. Um, the machine skating round, um, easily pulled with 16 ton air chain hoists. So the nitrogen air jacks um, use 12 of them, each capable of lifting 250 tons each. Um, so we, we're about two thirds of that. Uh, it's just like a hovercraft or an air hockey table. Um, we use nitrogen because it's got bigger molecules and it's much more compressible than air. And it's all about reducing the footprint under the machine because of the small working space. You can see there the, the machine being moved and a, a little blue can of silicon oil to keep everything moving. Um, just a rubber seal on the bottom of each pad. So you can see why this welded steel deck floor was almost essential. Um, we say, use the same system for the pressuring moving across the shaft, otherwise we'd have had to build that in four quadrants with lots of temporary works holding it together. Um, so that, that worked really well. And the conveyors, um, not to be overlooked, uh, critical to this works being successful. A lot of prefabrication on the surface. You see that the 4D plan uh, pretty much matched the reality of what we did. Um, so I should mention that H&E, the conveyor providers, were subcontracted into the Herring Connect subcontract package, which made management of them a lot easier. Um, so the, the gantry cradle was split into two. Um, so the top half was attached to the back of the pressure ring, and that was pulled in during the launch. So we didn't have to put in any temporary running rails for the gantry bogies or any segments. Uh, that's never been done before, I don't believe. You can see the two different shades of steel there. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the pressure ring launch itself because Ricardo is here tonight, gave a presentation on that back in April. So if you've got any questions uh, on that, you can find him in the bar. Uh, it only took three and a half days, 200 mil strokes. Also, PHL are here tonight if you've got any questions on that. Segment supply was also a challenge. We didn't have a, a segment crane or, or a quick unloader. So the segments had to go direct onto the segment feeder. Um, so we kept it simple with a big uh, forklift to take them in one by one. Uh, the gantries, um, you saw how quickly they went round as well. All the conveyors had to come out again. Um, the conveyor out, output on gantry one is central, whereas normally it'd be at the side on the back of gantry three. That also meant we couldn't do any vertical lifts for the segments as well. So the whole works from breakthrough to mining again with full backup took 90 days. 
compared to the 120 days programmed. And worth mentioning, at the end of drive two, we decided to pull the gantries back through the tunnel um, to take them out at Greenwich to save programme time. Uh, and we went so fast, Turn Connect were worried about the bearings overheating and the bogies, but uh, it all went well. Uh, so two 35 kilonewton Trojan units pulled them through the tunnel very quickly. <coughs> so just to summarise, key innovations is the nitrogen air deck, the lifting belt, the sliding deck for the gantries, the pressuring launch, and thank you to our subcontractors, H&E, Herring Connect Field Services, Mamut, Max Wild. I'll hand over to David. Hello, I'm uh, David Baggs, Instrumentation and Monitoring Coordinator for Riverlink CJB. Uh, I work with a team of monitoring engineers and surveyors uh, to monitor the ground movements and deformations resulting from the Phil Town Tunnel project, uh, with the purpose of feeding this information back to the tunnel team uh, to verify the design predictions. Uh, so here's a hierarchy of our process. Our designer carries out a damage assessment uh, that informs their outline monitoring plan, which includes trigger levels to be monitored. Uh, we then use this information to inform our detailed contractors monitoring plan. And in addition, we have an action plan with well-defined process of what happens when each trigger level is breached. Uh, this flow diagram illustrates this process in a condensed way, uh, where the input is the monitoring data from the various sensors on site and uh, survey results outputting trigger level alerts uh, from SOC on SOCTEX monitoring plan Calyx, uh, either green, amber, or red, uh, based on the designer's assessment of the asset. Um, this usually leads to an action from the INM team, which may mean gathering uh, the construction team and designers to assess the results in relation to the works that have been carried out. Uh, so what do we monitor? Uh, there are assets either side of the River Thames in Silvertown and Greenwich. Uh, our scope was several uh, third party assets and surface settlement monitoring above the tunnels and the cross passages, uh, plus the structures required to construct and enter the tunnels, including the launch, the retrieval, the rotation, uh, the portals, and the cut and cover structures um, on, on both sides of the river. Uh, one major third party asset we monitored was the London cable car, um, made up of three towers between 66 and 90 metres in height, uh, with a one kilometre cable spanning between uh, two stations north and south of the river, uh, and has tilt metre. The, the South Tower is the closest uh, asset at 24 metres from the axis of the northbound tunnel, uh, and has tilt metres, strain gauges, and a tidal gauge installed on it. Um, but the tower that you can see there is in the middle of the river, uh, so access is quite complicated. And here, here we are, jumping from the front of a boat and climbing up a ladder onto the south tower at high tide, uh, uh, as there's a tidal variation of several, me several metres you need to go during high tide uh, for the boat to reach the ladder. Uh, the south station, which is the pass passenger terminal in Greenwich, is just 15 metres uh, from the southbound tunnel, and our subcontractor, Sogtech, installed levelling in bar barcodes, prisms, strain gauges, and, um, and tilt metres to monitor this building. Um, we also have two river walls where inclinometers, uh, horizontal tilt metre beams, uh, and pressure cells were installed on the foreshore. Uh, which made installation and maintenance logistically complex, um, including the agreements required from the Environment Agency and the Port Authority, Port of London Authority, uh, which our consents and engagement team uh, did a great job of managing. Uh, and we also had some buildings of various shapes and sizes adjacent to the two tunnels um, as well. You can see a basement and some, um, some buildings in the design district in uh, Greenwich. Um, but the primary form of monitoring for the TBM was the installation of approximately 250 uh, levelling points in Greenwich, made up of 
15 transects and two longitudinal rays for the southbound and northbound drives. These were surveyed daily within the TBM zone of influence to measure settlement at surface level and to validate the design predictions. Uh, with trigger levels set based on 1% volume loss for the southbound tunnel and 1.25% volume loss for the northbound tunnel. Uh, next are a few examples of these horizontal profiles from the monitoring transects. Uh, so this is section five, which is on top of the river wall in Greenwich and shows a settlement trough from the southbound tunnel uh, represented by the grey horizontal line in this chart and the cumulative settlement of the southbound and northbound TBM drives uh, represented by the black horizontal line. Uh, and the dash vertical lines show the, axis, the central axis of the TBM tunnels. Uh, here's another, section 10, uh, where the colour of the TBM was less than one, meter, one diameter, uh, but still within uh, the, the, the results were still within the design predictions with 100% of the design prediction uh, represented by the uh, amber line there. Uh, this, this animation uh, here shows the longitudinal surface settlement monitoring for the southbound TBM drive, the horizontal axis at the bottom representing the progress of the TBM from the river on the left towards the end of the tunnel at the rotation chamber as we go along. These results show between 10 and 20 millimetres on average, with slightly more here um, as the cover decreases towards the end of the tunnel on the right. Um, the settlement due to the TBM drive was less than 50% of design predictions, uh, which is represented by the amber line there. Um, there are a couple of challenges uh, associated with this approach, uh, surveying, uh, which included having a survey team working seven days a week um, throughout the TBM operations. Uh, plus, when working in a public area, a particular challenge we faced was the theft of high-value survey equipment. And one of our most important employees to prevent this was Jerry, uh, our survey, survey security dog. <laughs> uh, there he is. Uh, then on the northbound longitudinal axis, sh uh, shape accelerators were installed by geotechnical observations. Um, made up of several overlapping 20 to 30 metre instruments fixed with P-clips bolted to the tarmac um, and covered with sandbags and water barriers. Uh, we did this three times in total in those locations, installing, removing, reinstalling the instruments in three, in three separate locations, shadowing the progress of the TBM. Uh, the first location was the start of the TBM drive between the surcharge and the road. Um, to monitor the TBM leaving the ground treatment area. Uh, second location was in the central reservation uh, of the road while the gantries were being connected to the TBM following relaunch. Um, at this point, the TBM was static for a period and then required to restart. Um, and then the third location was adjacent to the design district buildings and was to continue to give us a high frequency of readings uh, during the tunneling. Uh, so here are the results from the uh, first shape array uh, leaving the ground, ground treatment area on the left, uh, showing around 30 millimetres of settlement, which was confirmed by our levelling points, our manually read levelling points, which we installed along the array. Um, this rolling approach has some logistical challenges in predicting where and when the TBM will be, um, and then assembling the traffic management and uh, an area protected from uh, cars and pedestrians. Uh, to install this instrumentation. But once it's in place, it gives us uh, frequent, reliable readings 24 hours a day. Uh, so that's just a brief overview of the, the monitoring and our approach, and I'll hand over to Christina. Good evening. It's lovely to see lots of familiar faces in the audience. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Christina, and as you may have guessed from the slide behind me, I'm part of the Cross Passages team. I'm going to talk to you a bit about the Cross Passages on our project. There are seven Cross Passages. I like, there are actually eight, but one of them is done by the civils team because it's basically a hole in a concrete wall. 
David told me I had to start with a joke, so I thought I'd try and do one at his expense slightly. Um, the short, they vary in length, the shortest being cross passage one, which is about 4.5 metres long, barely a cross passage at all, and uh, the longest cross passage six, which is about 13 metres. This is the kind of standard rough shape of one of our cross passages. You can see we've got collars next to each TBM bore. These are quite heavily reinforced at the collars to withstand the hoop strength in the long term of the TBM segments and the opening created. And then you've got a barrel section in the middle. This is except for CP1. As I mentioned, that's extremely short, so you can't get a barrel in there. It's just one long collar. To give you an idea of scale, the barrel section is about 4.9 meters external diameter and the collar 5.6 tall and 5.5 wide. It's not quite a circular shape of the collar, which I'll explain later on in the presentation. As Siva touched upon, the geology varies along the length of the TBM tunnel and consequently also within the cross passages themselves and therefore we had different ground treatment at the differing uh, cross passages. CP1, right at the rotation chamber, used the, well, sorry, was within mainly the river terrace deposits, but because we had the soft pile treatment for the relaunch of the TBM, we didn't really need to do anything there, so that helped. CP2 and CP7 are predominantly in London clay, particularly above access level. And then you have some Harwich formation and Lambeth group below. Um, we had dewatering for these. And CP3 to CP6, uh, much more granular um, within the Lambeth group. And ground freezing was the ground treatment used here. Uh, this gives you a feel for the kind of geology that we were looking at. So you can see there CP2, the London clay at the top. You can see how successful the dewatering was um, with the sand there. It was very stable, which was great. And on the right-hand side, CP5, you can see how far in the ice has uh, got. And yeah, the, it sands, and you can see lots, lots and lots of shells in the shelly beds. There's a reason they've called that. Uh, and here is what it looks like within the tunnel. So you have the ground freezing on the left with the 26 freeze pipes in order to create a frozen arch around our cross passages. Um, with We had to create a plat steel platforms to go past them. The depressurization on the way um, on the right-hand side at CP2, the uh, the pressures were brought down by surface wells and then internal wells at CP2 to lower it further and allow us to excavate those. Um, I'll touch a bit more on the ground freezing. So as I mentioned, 26 freeze pipes. These were um, drilled from the southbound to the northbound to create a 1.5 meter arch around the tunnels. We also had two drainage pipes which allowed us well, they also had pressure sensors, so we knew when the freeze body had closed um, because of the increase in pressure, and they also allowed us to drain some excess water. We had an extensive temperature monitoring system. You can see on the right an extract from the monitoring portal we had online with um, sensors at the northbound. It also showed the sensors at one meter interval at three lances at each cross passage, and Zublin are freeze contractor was able to monitor this and would get notifications if there was any uh, issues or sudden changes and could change these all remotely, which added to the safety of it all. In terms of what we used, it was a brine for freezing calcium chloride. Yeah, that's it. Um, and then we could start the SCL works once all the ground treatment's done. So you can see there our Volvo excavator, which was used, and what a tight squeeze it was between the segments. Um, and you can see on the right the lovely finish that was created. Once the SCL works were done, we um, used sheet membrane for waterproofing. Another advantage, we increased the thickness of the geotextile, which meant only the invert had to be regulated rather than regulating everything, saving further time. 
I mentioned before, it was heavily reinforced. You can see there some of the cage at one of the collars to get an idea of quite how heavily reinforced it was. Within the main barrel, instead, we had steel fibers as well and polypropylene fibers, which meant that we didn't have to have a fireproof mortar because it was all fire tested. Um, originally, uh, we looked at a bespoke shutter for each cross passage. However, each one has a different inclination, skew, and it kept changing. So we're very happy that we eventually went for the timber shutters with which we could make up on site, and we had a very talented team to be able to let us do that. And here you can see the finished product of CP1. I'd like to cut, discuss a few key design features. So one of them was the fact we had no opening sets. Uh, Banaher, who produced our segments as well, you can see here how heavily reinforced they are that as well as the regular dowels on either side, you had shear bicones. This allowed us to just remove one segment, the shear to be transferred within the surrounding segments. You had five rings of special segments around uh, each opening, and the segments were just built like a, a regular TBM segment, apart from one being in the position of the cross passage. And you can see there how little space it took up and made our lives a bit easier. And then there, that's where we've drilled and you can just pull it out, no additional strengthening required within the tunnel. Another design feature was the original design went for a round collar. You can see how much more space this takes up than the final geld side layer solution of this kind of rounded rectangular collar. If you look in section, that shows it even more, how, how much further down the original went, how difficult that would have been to get into that little corner um, without having any rebound and things like that. But most clearly, the freezing just wouldn't have worked with the original design. You can see there the freeze pipes going around the shape of the collar and how low they are to, because you need to go around the collar um, and that, Sorry, the photograph is of the smaller drilling rig we had for the freeze pipes. It's right in the invert of the tunnel. As it was, you couldn't have gone any lower. Some key challenges to reflect on. We started construction and drilling of freeze pipes as soon as the northbound tunnel was being progressed. So once the TBM had passed CP2, we started mining. Once it had gone past CP3, we started drilling for freeze pipes. But you don't know where the northbound tunnel is going to be exactly until it's been built. This meant that our design was changing as we were constructing, which required a lot of collaboration between our subcontractor, our designer, and ourselves, which worked well. As I discussed before, the narrow opening, it's hard to get a machine that fits in a two meter gap um, and is also strong enough to break through frozen ground. The Volvo had the tracks narrowed for us so they could fit through that gap. And we thought, I think, at the start that the spraying on frozen ground would be the challenge. In the end, it was actually the excavation that possibly provided more of a challenge, but getting in the Brock solved that. And some of the success, so rapid completion. Our four frozen cross passages were built within 35 working days. We had zero health and safety incidents. And as Mikel will discuss, there were a lot of interfaces between ourselves, the TBM, and the highways team. What made it a success, though, was the great leadership from the team above ground, but also <coughs> the men below ground who really knew what they do were doing and were very experienced. And that's why it was a great project. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Mikel Gorigolzari, and I'm part of the team uh, who delivered the feed out works inside the, the tunnel, which is uh, still delivering them. I would like to start with the concept design. Uh, as you can see in the, in the bottom picture, it's quite a standard uh, fit out design for a new built uh, highway tunnel. 
um, to start with the with the infill, it was uh, originally designed to be made of granular material, and um, to have a perforated pipe catching all the um, all the infiltration water in the invert, uh, driving it to the lowest point of the of the tunnel, um, as well as the main uh, gravity drainage uh, system. Uh, catching the water from the seven meter wide uh, carriageway through uh, curve drains, bringing the water, uh, the run of water to the main collector. And as I was saying, um, ending this uh, water journey in the lowest point of the tunnel uh, with um, a water tank that I will explain in, in the next uh, slide. Talking about the mechanical and electrical systems um, under the carriageway, we, uh, where we designed the the main uh, HV ducting and lower voltage ducting feeding the cross passages uh, equipment and and we have a power quite big power manholes every uh, 40 meters and the drainage manholes every 50 meters uh, for maintenance purposes um, under the footpaths which are 1.1 meter wide uh, we have uh, communications uh, ducting and power uh, ducting also with uh, cabling feeding the jet fans we have uh, we will have uh, 12 Jet fans in the in the project, and to finish with uh, the reflectance paint, which uh, will increase the the uh, yeah the reflectance uh, and the uh, luminous luminosity luminaires in the inside the tunnel. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, in the lowest point of the tunnel, uh, it was designed to have a, a water tank with a pumping station that will pump the water from the uh, from both tunnels towards the north portal. This uh, pumping station is made of uh, three pumps that you can see there in the in the 3D in the 3D sketch, and uh, this was designed to be made of uh, precast elements, uh, 166 units per tunnel. And the reason to go from in situ to precast was because this was from the beginning uh, uh, meant to be built during the rotation of the TBM. So to fit this inside the, the rotation program, we had to, to build it in, in precast. And I can say it was a success. I will explain a bit more uh, later. I would like to talk a bit about the program. Uh, this was the, um, the program that we have more or less uh, a year ago when the, the TBM was tunneling uh, southbound towards the rotation chamber. Uh, it was scheduled to start the, the rotation in February, and originally it was meant to take uh, four months. And as I was saying, uh, during this stage, the lower infill of the tunnel, which was meant to be granular, as well as the low point sump, uh, was meant to happen. Afterwards, uh, the TVM had to tunnel uh, back to the north, uh, from June to August, the strip out will take three months, and at that point we will start the fit out. Why? Because the fit out was well. When I say fit out, first activity will be um, a lower infill and uh, upper infill, etc. Uh, it was linked to filling the tunnel with uh, with 3,000 uh, cubic meters of uh, granular material, so it was linked to the uh, cut and cover ramps completion. Um, obviously, we had to rechange, uh, rethink all this strategy because at that point in, in time, uh, more than a year ago, we were a couple of months delayed in the, compared to our PTU program. So one, the first decision that we took was to change the infill of the tunnel from granular material to concrete, which uh, obviously the first thought is quite expensive, right? Yeah, it was, but uh, this allowed us to complete also the upper infill, including all the drainage, all the ducting, power, drainage manholes, at the same time as the TBM uh, was rotated. Well, in fact, we were one month uh, longer in this activity compared to the TBM because they saved uh, a month uh, during the rotation, as Mark has explained before. Then the TBM uh, tunneled uh, to the northbound uh, between May and June, and the strip out started in August, and it took two months. Again, they saved an amount there. And thanks to the concrete infill, not having the cut and covers ready, because the, the civils, they had the, their own program, which was a bit delayed. However, we, uh, we allowed the, um, the lower infill activity to start at the same time as the strip out started. Why? Because we also took the decision 
again, uh, another complicated activity uh, that Mark mentioned before, which was pulling the gantries to Greenwich, allowing the tunnel to be uh, freer uh, from and uh, be stripped out earlier. Stripping out the shield through the um, retrieval chamber and the gantries through the rotation chamber. As you can see, the low point sum happened in, in September, then the upper infill, and these red uh, stars, which are the, the stars of the project, which is the MEP access dates uh, that will lead to achieving or not the PTU, were moved from April 24 to uh, late November, I will say first week of December, when we started uh, installing mechanical and electrical equipment inside uh, CP1 and, and CP2, which has already happened. This is the current state, of, well, not the current, sorry. This was uh, the state of the cut and cover ramps at the point when we started the infill. So it was impossible to bring 3,000 uh, cubic meters of, of uh, aggregate uh, through there. And this is um, a lovely picture that I like a lot. Is the moment when the priest uh, was doing the blessing to Jill uh, in that uh, congested rotation chamber. And maybe you think that this was a moment when all the side was shut down and uh, we were very focused on, on this uh, blessing. Uh, we were, but at the same time, there was a continuous sound of a 310 kilowatt pump pumping concrete, bam, 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 non-stopping, filling the, the southbound tunnel lower infill. Um, so this is a very it's a simple operation, concreting, but this is a good example that can be mirrored to the rest of the project of how we have escalated the, the level of um, uh, delivering these activities in such a congested uh, area, like you can see there. We placed there a high-pressure concrete line. Obviously, we were pumping 850 linear meters. We had to procure uh, 120 bar uh, pressure lines uh, and a, a powerful pump. But people said that we couldn't pump, uh, pump uh, lower cement content um, concrete that distance, and we did it. Obviously, we had to, to go to the supply chains, uh, different suppliers. We did trials, and we finally achieved it. As I said, in one month, we pumped nearly 7,000 cubic meters. We completed the lower infill. And at the same time, also to allow the, um, the logistics for the tunneling, uh, TBM, and also the cross passages, um, we had to build these uh, steel bridges that uh, Christina mentioned before uh, in the cross passages. And uh, another example of how we accelerated the works, as I said, in the concept design, the, the low point sound was meant to be uh, precast, uh, which was a very good idea. Um, but uh, in the program, we had to squeeze it a bit more. Originally, it was, um, the methodology was uh, um, thought to be uh, lifted inside in position with a mobile crane inside the tunnel, and we said, no. Uh, this cannot be like this. We need to think about something different uh, because imagine uh, the congested area, the health and safety issues that we could have uh, bringing a mobile uh, crane inside the tunnel. So we went to an Italian manufacturer. We designed a bespoke machine um, able to lift uh, 16 ton uh, units. And uh, this, uh, this uh, precast uh, structure that is made of eight units on the left that you can see there, they are like a quarter of a circle more or less. They are installed first, but this elephant, we call it. And after the A unit, in that corbel, the B unit, which is on the right, which is like kind of a bridge, uh, gets supported there. Uh, for this also, we designed some bespoke uh, cradles to carry on with the multipurpose service vehicles of the TBM during the rotation uh, on the southbound. Uh, we carry in, inside the tunnel these elements. So another example of this uh, uh, power manholes that we had to build inside the tunnel. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the retrieval chamber after disassembling the, the shield. Um, and when we were doing the, uh, the infills works and the, and the power manholes installation, they are five ton uh, in weight, and the slabs, they are nearly nine ton. So we have to have a special pick and carry cranes inside the tunnel to complete it, to complete those, those lifts. Also in the right, Another example of how we had to, to fill a curbing. A curbing is a simple, is, is a simple operation, but if you have to do curbing, bring in, bring in the concrete, with this cantilever beam, things get a bit uh, more complicated. Why? Because our civil colleague, they need to cast in the, the slabs uh, approaching to the tunnel. Uh, this is how the, the infills inside the tunnel uh, were looking. That's the second stage uh, concrete being poured. Uh, an example on the right of the crossing of the drainage pipes with the, with the ducting. And the current stage, 
is, uh, is this. On the left, you have uh, the, first, uh, the first trial that we did with the luminaires and the, on the tunnel. And at the moment, we are, um, well, we have completed the, the upper infill with all the drainages inside the tunnel, except in the cross passages that at the moment we are demobilizing the, the equipment. And we are in the process of finalizing the, the footpaths and start uh, painting the, the reflectance paint. In fact, we started in one cross passage. Also in the cut and covers, um, the civil team, they have uh, started finishing some, some uh, sections of cut and cover. We enter already there. Hopefully by early next year, we will have uh, a full road uh, giving access to the uh, logistics of the mechanical and electrical uh, operations. And, and there you have the low point sand water tank being waterproofed. So this was my last slide. slide. I hand over to Ivo. Uh, don't worry, Dickie, the bar is coming. Um, I've always said that the program on, on, on this particular job has been absolutely brutal. And, and what you've seen today represents 14 months of work, 14 months of mining. We started mining um, September and we finished mining November, 14 months. Two TBM drives, one TBM rotation and seven cross passages, four of which were in frozen ground. I think... Um, I would wish on all of you um, to have one Silvertown job in your career because this has certainly been mine. The technical challenges have been interesting. Yeah, you know, all jobs have technical challenges. But the greatest thing for me is working, working with this tremendous team, um, both on the stage and in the audience tonight. It's been a, a, a great privilege um, to work with that team and to overcome the challenges. Um, but just briefly, <clears throat> a final nod to our past. Um, we on Silvertown were under the river for 25 days for each drive. Each, each way sat on the edge of my seat for 25 days and 25 nights, knowing the combination of very shallow ground and mixed face was more than challenging. Ernest Moyer and his team of miners were under the river for 55 weeks in 1894, in the most appalling ground conditions, at two and a half bar of pressure, with three separate inundations from the overlying river. I, I take my hat off to those boys, and also to Moyer's wife, Margaret Lady Moyer, the first woman to walk the Blackwall Tunnel, and was the co-founder of the Women's Society of Engineers in 1919. In conclusion, I believe this team and you out there are worthy successors um, to Moyer's um, work. And I'll leave this picture up for questions and answers because the more I look at this picture, the more I want to know about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, we'll open the uh, floor up to questions. Could you say your name and affiliation for asking your question, please? Uh, thank you, team. As I've said, a fantastic uh, presentation and well done to all of you and great. Quick question on the, uh, sorry, Steve Parker, Keystone Tunnel. Question on the cross passages, on the freezing, I was interested. When you froze the ground, did that permeate to the center? And when you were excavating, did you just use a normal revolver with a bucket, or did you have to use a breaker for the ice on the outside and then a bucket in the middle, or how did the excavation and freezing work? Um, so as you might have been able to see from the CP5 picture, the ice came in at about a meter. Um, CP3 was frozen for the least amount of time. By the time we got to CP6, there was slightly more ice within it, just because we started CP3 first and went through sequentially. Um, yes, you definitely had to use a breaker on the uh, ice sections. As I mentioned, that was one of the biggest challenges. The little Volvo started to struggle a little bit by the time we got to CP4, which is when we got the Brock in and it went back to taking one advance, uh, sorry, one shift to do an advance muck and spray, whereas it had been getting to the point where it was taking nearly an entire 
day to just do one excavation. The core did say fairly soft, so you were able to take that out with the bucket. Okay. Next question. Um, Beth and Haig, Dr. Sarah Partners. Um, apologies, Christina, it's another question for you. Given that you had reinforced the main bore rings around the cross passage openings and that they were open at both ends, were there any questions as to why there was quite so much steel needed in the opening sets on the back, as the stress would presumably have already redistributed when the openings were made through? Um, some of the stress would have been, this is probably a, more of a question for our designer, I would say, than myself, but um, some of the stress isn't entirely redistributed, particularly on the frozen cross passages, because the ground's expanded and in a way that's kind of supporting the balls themselves. Um, and it's only in the long term that the secondary lining is taking the full extent of the, uh, sorry, the ground pressures. In fact, we looked uh, briefly at switching off the ground freezing before um, completing the secondary lining, and that wouldn't have been possible because you would have needed more strengthening of the shock rate and other things because the rings themselves couldn't have taken that pressure just by themselves. I think maybe the steel was a bit overkill, just, you know, but <laughs> it was needed. <laughs> Neil Phillips um, from Covey. Um, for the segments, uh, did you look at a range of GGBS replacement prior to coming up with 40%? And if so, what, why 40%? Um, and then, kind of, sorry, secondly, how much of that carbon saving was lost in the concrete infill? I mean, it's uh, really the designers uh, worked with, uh, you know, Banaha to come out with uh, uh, the design. Uh, I think they can only go up to a certain uh, percentage because we need a cement content. So we can't completely take out. So only they go up to 40% to take out. And as for carbon saving, no idea. <laughs> but I, I think, uh, I, and, and, and you're right to point out, um, um, there is a carbon cost in, in infilling in concrete, um, but sometimes one has to look at the overall goal and the overall um, uh, uh, sustainability, UN sustainability goals, which I think Silvertown does pr provide us. And remember, this has given us an enormous program advantage. Um, we've handed over to um, M&E four months early. So you have to look at the whole um, rather than the part when you consider carbon saving. Jamie, Jamie Standing, Imperial College. Yes, thank you very much for a really excellent series of presentations. I've got a question for David on the monitoring, and it's a very simple one, David. Are there, is there going to be long-term monitoring? Is there any plan for long-term monitoring? Or have you seen the monitoring <coughs> rate of settlement diminishing? Has it finished? Yeah, the, state of the, uh, the monitoring, uh, the settlement rate has decreased uh, uh, several weeks, basically after the after the after the completion of the tunneling, um, we're we're tracking that rate, and it's it seems to have settled everywhere. So, um, yeah, we're completely happy with that. It's less than it's less than two millimeters per year. So at the moment, at the current rate. So yeah, it has. Thanks. John Davis, GCG. Um, thank you all. Great presentation. Obviously, a brilliant job. Um, my question is for Ivor, and Ivor it only needs a one-word answer. Um, are you going to write all of this stuff up, particularly, obviously, for me, the stuff involved with the ground? Yes. Okay, and I've, I've got a few observations. No answers required. On three, Crossrail 305, which wasn't that far away, uh, we had difficulties with brushes. Um, I'm delighted to see you managed to, to keep all the water out of the laminated beds, because that wasn't always easy. What else? There was one more. I can't remember. I'll tell you in the bar. Thank you very much. 
question right at the back. Uh, Danny Trump, Department for Transport, thank you for a fascinating talk. I'm interested, uh, having been involved with some of the bidding of this with Riverlinks way back, um, what was the relationship like with your client and would there be any way that you would see to improve it if something was similar to happen again? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I, I, I believe the re relationship was, was very good with TfL. Um, and it, I suppose from a construction joint venture, remember we also had the, 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 the SPV as a client. Um, very hands-on in terms of quality monitoring, um, program monitoring. Um, in terms of method, very hands-off. Um, the construction joint venture were left to decide upon their own methods. Um, and, and, and the client w was, was primarily interested in the quality of what we were providing. And, uh, and for me, that, that, that's, that's, that's why you employ a contractor, to work out how you're going to do the job. Um, so I don't believe that the, the, the relationship um, uh, could, could be improved from, from, from my perspective. Question at the back there. Yeah, uh, Tom Robinson, London Bridge Associates. Uh, question for Steve and Mark, uh, really. Uh, was, uh, you mentioned ground treatment, which was carried out adjacent to the uh, adjacent to the peanut shaft and adjacent to the reception shaft on uh, Greenwich. Was any consideration given for uh, to, for using using a starter tunnel? Uh, for the drives, or, or was that was that not considered so to, to to save on the on, on the starting program for the TVM and the, minimise the degree of umbilical launch? Uh, yeah, I can I can take that. Um, not in not in that ground condition. I think I think as my as um, a previous um, uh, uh, a person that I work for I would say, not on your Nelly in that ground condition. Um, if the, the ground, we, we were so shallow uh, and in such fractured ground, um, particularly at Greenwich, um, that uh, a, a starter um, drive um, would have been impossible. Any other questions? David Hartwell, retired. Um, Christina, um, as someone who did ground freezing back 30 years ago in store belt for cross passages, a um, number of us were made were very unpopular by saying, no, you can't do ground freezing from one side. You have to do it from both sides because of the collar, which I think you intimated when you showed the original design with the collar underneath. And no, you can't drill horizontally below that. So congratulations to whoever for sorting out that problem and allowing it to be horizontal. Um, but how did you assure yourself completely that the freezing against the receiving side had a complete seal and a full thickness of seal on the receiving side? Um, great question. As I mentioned, we had two pressure sensors uh, within the main tunnel, so you could see quite clearly from the monitoring when the pressure's gone up, you've probably enclosed and the freeze is expanding into the area. In addition, in the northbound rings, there were 14, 16, far too many in my opinion, sensors. But it was a, really made us aware of what the ground was doing there. Originally, they were just drilled into the segments. Um, so we had the combination of sensors just in the northbound segments. Then we drilled some all the way through, right into the ground. So it was pretty clear that the freeze had expanded right to the edge of the tunnel. We also had the lances in three locations every meter so you could see that kind of gradient of minimal temperatures right in the middle as you'd expect because it's more insulated from the two running tunnels <coughs> and how far it's going up either side. I hope 
answers. Another question halfway back to it. Hi, uh, James Rigby, National Highways. Um, yeah, it looks like a, an excellent project to, to, have, uh, to have completed and, and been, is it three, four months ahead of the programme? Absolutely fantastic result. Um, the, and you, you described the shallow ground conditions. And my, I understand from rule of thumb, you go round about um, a diameter below a, a river to, for, for safety in, in good ground to do it in, in very challenging ground conditions. That must have been quite a, a, a challenge to overcome during the design and through construction as well. Um, yeah, it, 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 it was a challenge. We did, we did, we did certain things to mitigate it. Um, the, the reference design, um, for example, um, had the, the rotation shaft closer to the river. Um, and we were set by the, the, the up and down gradient to get to the nadir of the tunnel. Um, we extended the drive um, to uh, the rotation um, chamber that's shown in the photographs. And by doing that, we provided the seven and a half meters of cover under the river, which is still half a diameter. Um, and then in terms of conditioning and in terms of TBM control, um, we had a um, 24 hour, seven day monitoring in, in the TBM control room, providing independent checks and balances on what the TBM operator um, was doing downstairs. No control within the operator, uh, within the control room, but we could, could see exactly what the TBM operator was doing at all times. And that data was reviewed twice daily and added, added a high level. I, I would always be involved in reviewing that data, whether it was weekend or, or during the week. Um, hence my comment about being sat on the edge of my seat day and, day and night. There's no doubt it was, it was um, nerve-wracking, but think what it must have been like for 55 weeks. I only had to do it for 25 days. Yeah. Question? Andrew Smith, uh, <coughs> retired. I was impressed by the carbon reduction measures taken making the segments that then seem to be rather negated by hauling all the way to, to London on, on lorries. I think you said three, three lorries per ring. I um, yes. just wondered why it wasn't thought about bringing them in by boat <coughs> the way if they had to go to the port to start. I, I, it's just interesting that that same thing occurred to me on uh, Hinkley Point. Well, they were cast in Bristol, but brought in um, on, on road transport. Just, uh, I just wonder why that was. Yeah, I can do. The water, the waterfront wasn't capable of taking the weight of the craneage required to lift the segments off. Um, so, um, if if they were shipped in, they would have had to have been shipped in a lot further down river. Um, so, when when you when you start looking at the lorry movements then you've got a, a, a lorry movement from Banaher to the coast and then um, uh, shipped across and then one or two lorry movements to site. So then make them nearer the site then? Yeah, and that's, also the, that's a question for the UK market. And also the low and high tides we can't bring all the time to the site so that's uh, the issues you know so only we can bring in high tide time so that's mostly night time it's very hard to deal with the projects if we carry on like that. Any other questions? Uh, one there. And there's Rodrigo with Strava. Um, I couldn't help but uh, notice the um, dog for the monitoring team. And um, did you have many, many uh, Problems that you really needed to get a dog to protect the, the, your yeah. technicians. Yeah, people. We've had people driving with cars through the barriers into site and uh, stealing total stations during the day. So it is a it is an issue, and those guys were out in the public realm every day. So it was necessary for them for their for their safety as well, uh, uh, because it's quite an open area. 
whereas the others were on well, other surveyors were on site. Our surveyors were out on the road, um, so it was it was a necessity really with that that level of uh, that level of. Uh, Theft, basically. So yeah. So it did. It did. It did work. Yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. And how many AT, ATSs you get? You oh, we didn't. Stolen? From the from the site, there were a couple stolen from site, but not from uh, not from our surveyors that were were out in the public, with out with the public, not at all with the dock. No. Thank you. Cool. Yep. Question. <coughs> Hello, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm Samuel, second year student in City University. Um, the question is for Mark. Uh, you mentioned subcontracted into the HK management. I'm not too sure what that means. Would you mind explaining that? Uh, so the, the rotation works were mainly subcontracted to Heron Connect field services. Um, we had to integrate our temporary works into what they were doing, so we worked together and Heron Connect also own oh, or it's a subsidiary as H and E conveyors. Um, so integrating the conveyor design into their works is a lot easier rather than manage having two separate subcontracts. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? I think the bar's calling Rod. Yeah, well, more I, questions I, I, at the bar, please. I noticed Steve had run away quickly. Dicky, Dicky's, uh, Dicky's remarkably quiet up there. But. <laughs> okay, right. Thank you all, <coughs> all six of you, for uh, an excellent presentation. So uh, let's uh, give them a final thank you. And as Ivor is desperate to get to the bar, uh, we'll run through the uh, slides as quick as I possibly can. Um, the first two are very important. Uh, a very special thanks to the whole team of Riverlinks for sponsoring the uh, sausage and chips and for the bar tonight. And for the uh, Christmas jamboree, as uh, Ivor calls it. So that's for Ovial BAM, EcoPlant, PHL Hydraulics, Henry Connect, and the rest of the team. And uh, another photo of the, uh, the whole uh, Riverlinks team at one of the breakout, uh, breakthroughs. Uh, right, quickly moving on to um, next year. Um, next meeting uh, is Thursday, the 18th of uh, January. Artificial ground freezing, versatile solution for water tightness and temporary soil structure. Uh, quite an appropriate uh, follow on from uh, some of the uh, discussions tonight. That will be in here in person, starting at the normal time of 6 o'clock and 5.30 for tea, tea and biscuits downstairs. We then move on to uh, Thursday, 8th of February. Slightly uh, a week earlier, this is our joint meeting between BTS and Min South. At this present time, we are still, um, or Min South are still uh, arranging their speaker, I think they've been let down by the uh, first one they had. So we will confirm that out on the website as soon as possible. Moving on to uh, the 15th of February, uh, that is a young members um, evening, but we are all um, welcome to uh, attend. And it's how to demonstrate competence and safety in tunnel design, exploring the ro role of guidance and standards. I've been asked just to point out that um, Kieran's proportion of, tr of the talk will cover how the code standards and the ICE attributes for the professional qualification, the ICE code of conduct, including ethical considerations, all play their part in achieving this aim. And Christoph's portion will be particularly on the proportion 
will cover the Euro code basis as applied to tunnel, including the safety concept, reliability management, updates to EC2, and design of non-standard items. For the younger members that are here, the uh, BTS young members are looking for subcommittee uh, personnel. They've extended the uh, application deadline to Monday next week. So if you are aware, or if any of you wish to, so if, if you have any uh, young tunnelers that it would benefit them to be involved in the young members subcommittee, please have a chat with them over the next day or two and get them to put an application in to join the uh, BTS young members. That closes uh, on Monday. Closing on uh, 12th of January is the Harzing Prize, uh, again for the younger tunnelling engineers. Uh, the age limit is 33 or below. So uh, please look at, for further information and the rules are all on the BTS website. But again, we'd like to see plenty of applications coming in for that, for the Harding Prize. And the entrants and the winners um, end up with a uh, monetary uh, um, prize and also uh, the prize winner gets to uh, attend the uh, BTS dinner in uh, May. The design and construction course, uh, we're definitely promoting this early this year and uh, we will open for bookings uh, straight after Christmas. The main reason behind this is that uh, this year we've been limited to the number of um, spaces by Warwick because of other things that are going on at Warwick University. So we are opening the booking early, so we are limited to the number. So please get uh, your people on the course as early as possible so that you won't be uh, disappointed. Um, little update on the anniversary book. Um, Pre-orders will be um, opening in late February uh, and they will stay open for about three months as you can see up there. And they're planning to go to print in August 24 with the distribution in September in time for the BTS conference. If anybody or any company is still wishes to sponsorship, uh, sponsor the book, um, we are still open to accepting further sponsors. So uh, please uh, contact the team, as you can see there, either Sarah, John, or Ken. Also, uh, as I mentioned a second ago, the annual dinner is the 10th of May. Uh, booking will open in early February uh, and the flyer will go out very soon. So um, look at uh, getting your tables booked. Uh, a slide regarding tunnel skills. Um, and the vision values and the work they are currently doing. You can see that. Um, and if you haven't got quite time to read it, um, of course, the, uh, this evening's uh, presentation will be available on YouTube. So you can uh, go back and have a look at that. They are also uh, co-sponsoring the, uh, the food on uh, the January meeting, Tunnel Skills are.
uh, and that's a further slide regarding uh, that and the, uh, the members of Tunnel Skills. So again, if anybody would like to become uh, a member uh, and get involved in the development of training programs for the industry, we would most welcome uh, uh, additional people. And finally, um, Merry Christmas to you all. Um, enjoy your Christmas. Look forward to all, seeing you all in January. And uh, also see you down in the bar in a couple of minutes. <laughs>